Rahim. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Meera Mawani and I coordinate research activities for Association for the Study of Ginans. Welcome to the second talk of our webinar series, Ginan Insights, which began with the aim of exploring different facets of Ginans and deep dive into them. Through this online platform, we hope to bring to light past and current areas of research into Ginans so that this remarkable poetic heritage sparks greater awareness, provides space for sharing perspectives, generating conversations and further research in Ginan studies. Before I introduce our guest, I wanna make a few Zoom keeping announcements. You are all on mute. During the session, if you have any questions or comments or technical difficulty, please write in the chat box and one of our team members will get back to you. Towards the end of the talk, we will have time for a brief Q&A session. You can post your questions in the chat box. We will be recording this session. Finally, I hope you will spare some time to fill out our feedback form uh, for our team. Thank you. Today we have a very special guest. Let me introduce Dr. Karim Gilani to you all. Dr. Karim Gilani received his MA and PhD in Music and Religious Studies from the University of Alberta, Canada in 2012, and is also a graduate of the Institute of Ismaili Studies, UK. His research examines the role and power of musical sound and recitation within the socio-cultural and socio-religious contexts of Muslims in South Asia and North America. His PhD des dissertation entitled Sound and Recitation of Koja Ismaili Ginans, Tradition and Transformation is a pioneering work of ethnomusicological research that situates Ginans hymns within the wider context of Muslim piety. In general and South Asian poetic and musical contexts in particular. Dr. Gilani has taught various ethnomusicology courses at the University of Alberta from 2010 to 16. He regularly presents papers at national and international conferences. Dr. Gilani has been invited to share his academic and musical contributions in both national and international forums, including the BBC World, CBC Canada, and TEDx, to name a few. Dr. Gilani is an accomplished vocalist, composer, and songwriter. 
He has received training in Hindustani classical and Sufi music from renowned musicians of India and Pakistan. He has released a number of albums, his latest world music album being Masti e Tariqat, The Path of Ecstasy in 2018 worldwide. Dr. Gilani performs, regularly performs in North America and his greatest honor was to perform in front of Prime Minister Stephen Harper and His Highness the Aga Khan at the opening ceremony of the delegation of the Ismaili Imamat in Ottawa, 2008 and the foundation ceremony of the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, 2010. Dr. Gilani, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. We are excited to hear from you uh, on your views on musical and cultural contexts of Ismaili Ginans. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Gilani. Thank you very much, Meera, for your very generous introduction. And uh, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, to the Association for the Study of Ginans for giving me this opportunity to share some of my field research work and ethnographic ethnomusicological work, which I've been doing for the last two decades. And I hope that, um, you know, being a student of this field, I'm able to share some of my insights and also learn from so many educated participants here from their productive feedback. So this study, which I've been doing, will continue to spark and also continue to inspire others. So, so let me begin first with my formal presentation. Let me um, enter my presentation here. Just give me a second. Perfect. Thank you, Mira. So, so once again, thank you very much uh, to you all uh, to join this morning here in Edmonton, Canada, and perhaps um, evening and night in, in Asia and Africa, and uh, early evening in, in UK. So I'm really uh, honored to be a part of this session. And um, so let's begin first. Um, the title of the session is Sounds and Musical Context of Ismaili Ginans. And you can see a landscape tapestry of many pictures here. Um, these are related to the field research, extensive field research, I must say, which I have conducted over the last two decades. So, so let's, let's move and introduce the topic. So um, what I'm going to do today is, you know, I'm going to uh, explore three basic questions in my presentation. One is why sound matters. Very important question. And I will look into the key concept of sound within the Muslim context, because many of us think that uh, music is forbidden in the practice of Islam and why sound has played a key role towards spiritual, devotional, and also emotional lives of Muslim around the world. So we will explore that element. And then also uh, after exploring that key concept and misconception within the, the Muslim context, we will go into South Asia and study uh, the context within the South Asian cultural, religious, and musical context. The second question which I would like to discuss is what is the relationship of sound with cultural memory and communal identity? I think this is a very important question and it has, it has a deeper emotional affinity and connection as well. Just to give you a glimpse of it, uh, even today uh, when we recite Ginan such as Abha Teri Mohabbat Lagi or Sahib Jitu More Man Bhave. Although some of these Ginans were written by, for example, Sahib Ji, almost 500 years ago, but still this Ginan speaks to us this day, age and time and emo emotionally moves us. And we know in the past it has moved many of our Sayyid and many of the listeners who have been listening to the Ginan. So this is my second key question, which I would like to uh, discuss here that why sound and particularly Ginan play a very important role towards the emotional and cultural memories of Ismaili worldwide. And the third one is how music transcends cultural, geographical, linguistic, and historical boundaries. So these are the wider co concepts which I would like to discuss in. And then there are subtopics which will reveal why I would like to um, give my session into this particular direction. But before I do so, I think it is important to have a conceptual framework to begin with. Okay. So what I mean by conceptual framework is um, whenever we study anything, there are different ways of studying um, a topic. Some take historical um, 
conceptual background some take literary background to study certain text i have taken an ethnomusicological approach and i know many of you may not know what is ethnomusicology so that's why i have created this chart ethnomusicology is the study of music within culture but but it is much more than that and and uh, we have many scholars who have contributed immensely in this particular area so so you know here are some quotes which are, are related to the sound and music uh, such as um, abdul hussain al darab once said listening to music causes me to find the existence of the truth beside the veil amir khusro um, a 14th century sufi chishtia sufi once said music was the fire that burned heart and soul karl marx music is the mirror of the reality and you see this chart here when we are we are, we are looking at art in general um there are sub sections within art so you have architecture music theater calligraphy performing art and so on and so forth within music especially in the western context you, you have two major field one is musicology and another one is ethnomusicology ethnomusicology is a very recent field it uh, came into being at around uh, 1940s and 50s and in 60s 70s uh, it really developed especially in north america and then it is spread all over the world we have many renowned ethnomusicologists such as nazir jiraz boy regula burkhart qureshi bernon nettel and many others who have contributed immensely and many of them had a background in anthropology so this is the mixture of anthropology religious studies cultural studies which goes much deeper into uh, not only exploring the scientific study of the musical grammar and history but many other thing so for example here when we are talking about ethnomusicology quote in quote you know this is the combination of anthropology musicology social sciences religious studies and it study music from inside and from inside out and outside in we don't only study the grammar of music who composed it but what what was the background in which a certain piece was written what were the influences when these kind of pieces were written how people reacted to it so all the social context come and play a bigger part to to reveal the history in depth john blacking uh, once said humanly organized sound and soundly organized humanity so in ethnomusicology we really try to to uncover some of the hidden aspect of the music which has not been covered before uh so let's go to the next slide um when we are talking about ginan again from the conceptual framework uh john blacking once said each style of music has its own history and its present state represent only one stage in its development so when we hear the ginan for example sahib ji or aba teri mohabbat lagi or ai rehman rehman or, or any other devotional pieces this piece is not an example of the contemporary time in which we are living in it give us the history of that era when it was composed what were the influences at that time one can hear that what was the musical element what were the aesthetic and emotional element in which some of these pieces were living so this is very important to understand the music speaks for itself uh, polo colio said there is no need to say anything it it does happen with the ginan as well and we know many such stories that uh, when some of our uh, our jamati leadership have heard the ginan in the in the jamaat khana context or in a personal piety context how ginan has moved then and even this day age and time especially our, our senior members and when we go to jamaat khana if somebody recite ginan properly it really touches our heart so what are the key uh, method, methodology which i am going to use in my presentation these are some of the approaches which i have used uh, during my phd dissertation which i completed and submitted in 2012 uh, you know i would invite you all to go online and and look for the the um, the dissertation i think it is it is a really uh, remarkable piece and i would like to especially thank professor regular barkard qureshi michael frischkoff uh, professor ali asani and many others who have helped me to shape this work 
So what are the key, key methodological uh, um, tools through which I have explored this work? Number one is dialogical anthropology. Okay, so what is dialogical anthropology? What you do when you explore something from dialogical anthropology? So this is the tool where uh, a researcher try to stay away from the, the field in which the person is studying. So when I was studying and I was taking dialogical approach, I wanted my participant, those whom I was interview, interviewing, that to be in the front. I, I was not guiding them how you are going to communicate with them regarding the topic. They were guiding me regarding their influences on certain aspect of the study of Gina. I have also taken musical and cultural approaches uh, from Regula Burkhard Qureshi. Uh, if you don't know her, uh, she's an authority of the Sufi music of Kavali. Her book on Sufi music of India in Pakistan is the best book on Kavali music, which she conducted in many other parts. I would highly recommend this. Um, I would also recommend you Music and Memory by Professor Earl Waugh, another supervisor of mine, and Music and Architecture by Michael Frischkov. I think some of these works are very important. So I've taken particularly cultural and, and musical approaches from Regula and some of my scholars I just mentioned. Uh, there are some ethnograph ap approaches as well, religious studies approaches um, from Stanley Tumby Geertz about ritual drama and all that. And, and, and also um, uh, some of the studies which are related to, to sound, I've also explored. Um, and when it comes to one of my last chapters, which was on music beyond boundaries, Ismaili Ginan migration and transmission. I've also taken a lot of migration theories and contemporary theories, which also apply to this particular area. So let's go deep into now the, the main topic. Okay, so what are the differences among music, sound, and noise? I think it is very important to understand. Music is an organized sound, and noise is an unorganized sound. When somebody sings to us in a tuneful way, that voice creates a magical music which touches our heart. Some people say that we recite Ginans. I would say that yes, we recite Ginan because this is the term we often use, but all the notes which we recite are based on the, the musical sounds. Ginans, Hasidas, Hamd, Geet, some of those um, zikr, they are based on organized sound. That's why they are very soothing to our ear. In olden times, when, when Hindu pandits were teaching shlokas, they were using different sound for children to remember. Even today, when we hear Ginan in Jamaat Khana, it really reminds us of our memory. Musical voice, the human voice is the oldest instrument on earth. Musical sound, voice, is the pure way of expressing music. In oral traditions such as Indian classical music from South Asia, even in this day, age and time, whenever guru wants to teach any instrumentalist, either sitarist, violin, harmonium, tabla, anything, he teaches them through his voice. For beat, he would demonstrate such as Dage Nati Nage Dinna. And then the disciples, the student will, will play that. When we sing Ginan, the musical notations are never written there. It is a part of our memory. That's why in olden tradition, it used to say, Jo dil se nikalta hai, wo dil ko touch karta hai. If you sing from your memory, if you sing from your heart, it is definitely going to move other people's heart. So when we are talking about music, music is an organized sound. And noise is an unorganized sound. Um, when we are talking about music, we need to understand that this terminology, the way it has come down to us historically, was not even present there during the time of Prophet Muhammad. 
it came to to the Middle Eastern languages um, and South Asia around 11th, 12th century. So almost 400 years after the demise of Prophet Muhammad. So if somebody comes to you and say music is forbidden in the practice of Muslim devotion, you need to ask them um, ethnomusicologically and etymologically, uh, when does the term music come from? So historically, that term was not even coined at that time. So when in the Western context, whenever we are talking about the structure of music, it is based on these four elements. One is rhythm and meter. Second is pitch and melody. Third is dynamics, loudness and softness. And fourth is form and sonic qualities. I'm not going to go into details if anybody would like to know more about it. You know, I have a session which I did uh, uh, recently on music. Islam and spirituality, which is available on YouTube. So you can take a look. So what I'm trying to say here is anything which we sing, if that particular piece has a rhythm and meter, if it has a pitch, if it has a dynamics, sonic quality, according to the Western musicology, it will fall under the category of music. When we recite, for example, Zikr, okay, Yareman Yarahim, Yareman Yarahim, Yareman Yarahim, Yareman Yarahim. It has the rhythm, it has the pitch, it has the melody. When we recite any Ginan, for example, Aba Teri. Again, it has the same thing. It has the pitch, it has the rhythm, dynamics, loudness. Although we may not call it as part of music, but when we are studying it from the ethnomusicological perspective, it may fall under the category of music. Same as Adhan, call to prayer. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It is a soothing sound which has moved many people. Hazrat Umar was also moved by the, the, the recitation of the Quran when he hear that his sister is reciting the Quran. He was moved and it has moved many people, especially when Bilal Habshi used to call to prayer Adhan and calling people to come. And why Azan was chosen? This is a very important theme to be understand. In other faiths, either they use bell to call people to come to prayer, okay, or there are traditions where they drum. But in Muslim tradition, we chose voice because voice is the complete musical instrument and the oldest instrument in this world. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Now, does this term music is universally applicable? I think that's a very important question. Do we need to use the term music when we are talking about Ginan? In my PhD dissertation, I deliberately did not use the word music because some people may have a different understanding about the term music. And they would take it music literally from, um, the, from the understanding of uh, perhaps the music which is not connected with the spirituality. What are the other terms people use? So there are terms such as mosiki, which comes from Greek Latin root, which I, I told you around 12th, 13th century. There is a word kira, recitation, Quran. Quran come also from kira, means reciting aloud. And in oral memory, a recitation of the Quran played a very key role towards uh, imparting and, uh, and sharing this knowledge from generation to generation. And even in this day, age and time, there are countries where children are taught Quran by heart and they memorize it by heart. And when a child is born, the, the, the Kari comes and recite some of the verses of the Quran because we believe that the orality of Quran is going to move not only the heart of a child, but also help these children to understand the deeper emotional um, meaning of this wonderful faith. Then there are other terms such as Dina and Takbir, which are also used in, in Arabic languages, which means raising the voice. Then in Indian music, we use the word Rasa and Ragas. 
interestingly ragas or rag comes from um sanskrit root which doesn't even mean music it means raga means colors so you you depict the you you paint the picture through um different sound when you are singing and rasa means mood there are 10 different moods through which uh, you can connect people uh, while you are reciting any form of music or art there is another word sama hearing and listening which we often hear vikr uh, means remembrance there is ma kirti balangun and many other terms again you know some of these terminologies we need to understand that all of these terminologies have developed within a different historical and cultural context okay so we don't need to borrow one term from one culture and apply and endorse into the rest of the world if people may not feel comfortable uh using the term music with some of their devotional traditions i think that is perfectly fine okay so now now move to um um you know i've already discussed this part um i'll i'll move to the the next slide i think uh, because of the time um so you know here you see al ghazali once said um he was a theologian a famous theologian um he once said whoever says that all music is forbidden let him also claim that the songs of birds are prohibited as well so um you know he gave a wonderful example that you can hear music the the nature and its sound all over the world and and it is it is organized sound uh created by nature so if you deny that music is forbidden then ask all the birds not to sing um in fact uh, you know our heartbeat constant heartbeat you know i think it's is the biggest um drum which we carry inside us and what happen when our heartbeats become really fast or slow you know of course you know we die you know we we um we have hard fit so so the the music which is attached to us has to be um you know has to work in in such an harmony that uh, we live our life for the fullest we understand and we we capture those moments in every every day when we look around inspired by the nature and also uh, use some of these ideas to become better uh, muslims there is the quran quranic verses which often uh, those uh, theologian and historians use against music just to give you uh, um, a glimpse of that that you would not find any single aya in the quran which is against um, or forbidden uh, for music um in fact um there are many anecdotes where prophet muhammad peace be upon him when he was migrating from makkah to madina people have received him with tala al badra a famous uh, qasida burda qasida which was sung there is another anecdote uh, where uh, there was a wedding where prophet muhammad asked his own daughter fatima do you know the ansar are coming to attend the wedding and ansar really likes music have you arranged musicians to entertain them and i would highly recommend you there are some good books uh, uh, one is uh, by christina nelson the art of reciting the quran i would highly recommend you to read there is another one uh, in urdu it's called islam or mausiki by pulwari uh, a, a wonderful work so there are a lot of and, and then uh, there are some historical works as well uh, on this this topic so so here this quranic word a quranic verse which often people uses end of mankind is he who purchases idle talks and in bracket they use music singing and the bracket close to mislead again bracket men from the part of allah so now you see when we read the translation of this verse it doesn't say the term music there it is an extension of that particular verse which people use okay and same as you know if you look at the bracket it says men why not women so these are some of the example one can see that 
people often use when they are talking about that why music is forbidden in the practice of Muslim devotion. We need to really look at the historical, cultural context that why some of these tafasir, some of these work um, doesn't give direct references from the historical sources. Anyways, let's, let's now move to the next slide. So then we need to rethink about the term music and its use in the Muslim world. In fact, Muslim scholars have contributed immensely when it comes to music. Al-Farabi, who was uh, from the 10th century, wrote a book, a, a, a big book on music, which was called The Great Book of Music. Akwanu Safa had one epistle out of 52 epistles. One epistle was completely dedicated to music. Fatmid, if you, if you study the Fatmid time, have, have really contributed towards the, the music and especially devotional music. And we have some of the historical, uh, historical data available. I would again emphasize another book called The Munshidun of Egypt by uh, Professor Earl Waugh, in which he has written that how Fatmi time devotional music was given a central stage in, in, in Egypt and how uh, the love and devotion of uh, uh, Panchtan Park became a central theme during the time of Fatmit region. Okay. And, and if you look at it historically, uh, Kanun, which is a Santur instrument, uh, which was created by Muslim, uh, was the forefather of the Western instrument piano. Same as Kitara and, and Oud instruments, which were developed in the Middle East almost 2000 years ago. And in, in Spain, it was very popular how guitar, modern day guitar, became the children or child of the instrument which we play oud in, in Spain around 15th century when Muslim used to rule that, that particular land. So we really need to understand the Silk Route and how some of these influences Muslims have played uh, historically. And in fact, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, sa, re, ga, ma, pa, which we usually sing, is, and especially in Western musical term, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, this musical terminology was also coined by Muslim uh, musicians historically. So we need to not only deny that music is forbidden in the practice of Muslim devotion, but it has played the huge part. Um, and if you look around, you know, in the Muslim world, there are many different devotional uh, form of uh, uh, music one can find. Kawali, uh, Naat, Hamd, Sama, Zikr, Nasheed, Wai, Kafi, and list goes on and on. Molana Hazrima uh, has recently said in his speech at the Aga Khan Music Award, and I think it's a very powerful message which Mulan Hazri Imam has given. And, and even uh, during the Diamond Jubilee, how art was given a lot of emphasis during the, the, uh, the music initiative which we had in, in Portugal. Um, so here what Mulan Hazri Imam has said, listening to music, practicing music, sharing music, performing music have long been an intimate part of life for Muslim communities across the world as has been the chanting of devotional and historical or epic text. Um, now I'm coming to my main topic. I have, I think, uh, given you a better context to situate uh, my specific work on the music of Smiley Ginans. So when we are talking about Ginans, we need to understand we are talking about South Asia. We are talking about Satpant community. Uh, even in the Ginan, you would not find a single term such as Ismaili, the term Ismaili has been used. Um, uh, you would find Satpan. So when we are talking about Satpan, we are talking about, of course, Khojas, we are talking about Mumnas, we are talking about Mahamargis, we are talking about many other offshoot Ismailis as well, who are not part and parcel of our current community. So when we are talking about Ginan, we are talking about specific areas which are currently in the border of India and Pakistan. Starting from, you know, if you look at the northern part of Pakistan, Multan, Lahore. And if you go down from Multan all the way to Rajasthan, Sindh, and then Kutch, Kathiawar, and Gujarat. So this is the border area we are talking about when we are studying about the Ginan and its music. So what I mean by that is all the languages which are spoken in this border area 
uh, our ginans mainly were composed in those languages the musical meters uh, and musical uh, genres which are practiced in this particular regions have also influence in our music uh, when we are talking about the term ginan we know etymologically derived from sanskrit language which comes from janana which means knowledge um, there are people uh, such as gulam ali alana from sindh think that yes ginan may uh, mean uh, uh, like divine knowledge gnosis but it etymologically may come from the term gina which has the arabic root and gana which has the ethnic indian root which means recitation or singing okay my first encounter why have i academically studied the ethnomusicology of smiley gina who am i to talk about this topic what is my connection with this particular topic and to be very honest my connection with ginan is is much more deeper then only uh, as an academician who study uh, any tradition mainly from both imic and etic from inside and from outside my connection go back to uh, when i was in grade 9 and also from my family my mom is sindhi and my father was uh, from bombay kathiawari um my mom is very much into uh, sufi tradition she uh, when we were growing up she often sing shabulati bitais sindhi wais kafi baba bulle shahs kafi sachal sarmas and also ginan so ginan was a part and parcel of our upbringing so it has always connected and spoken to us to to all of us and and this is not only me i think many of us and our families and our children and grandchildren are connected with ginan because we give a lot of love and respect to this particular tradition so my first encounter i was in grade 9 in bui in pakistan and i remember um, in grade 9 we used to have viva exam oral exam and i used to have a oral exam in agha khan school in garden so i went there and uh, you know i participated in the viva exam and i was not much prepared to be honest so i said you know i i know ginan many of them by heart inshallah i will i will pass so when i appear in the exam my my viva teacher asked me okay before you begin your ginan tell me in which rag are you going to sing the ginan so i was shocked what do you mean by that he says you don't know there are different types of tunes available of particular ginans i said i don't know please tell me more he said there are for example traditional tunes there are classroom method there are classical bandish available which are based on shastriya sangeet and then there are some random teachers who are teaching ginans so we wanted to know which raga are you going to sing the ginan from and i was really puzzled and i thought in myself i am going to fail it because i don't know anything about any of these you know different tunes and ragas so i told the teacher listen you know i i'm not aware of any of this but i will sing the way i was taught by my mother at home and i have no clue she has learned from her mother and i will sing it the way i was taught so i sang that way i closed my eyes i sang the ginan you know my heart beat was very fast and i knew i'm going i'm not going to make it and i sang and when i finished my ginan my ginan teacher said although your rag is little different than the rag which usually we hear in the garden and you know uh, in some of the areas in karachi but you sang with utmost love and devotion and i'm sure you have done well in your exam so that was my first encounter i'm talking about almost 30 years ago i'm now 45 years old so in grade 9 i was about 15 years ago so since then i have started my journey and i always wanted to learn from my masters my teachers wazin musicians i was personally approach them to 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 know and understand what are the methods they have used to preserve this beautiful tradition by the grace of mola in 2000 i got accepted at the institute of smiley study and in 2002 um um i had an opportunity to do my masters in ma in music and religious studies under the guidance of professor regular barkat qureshi 
and many professors such as Azim Nanji, Ali Asani, Professor Ismail, uh, Zawair Moit, Azim Kasa, many of them have encouraged me to explore this particular area and I'm really grateful for them. So when I had an opportunity to study this, I started my journey during my work at the university, uh, at the Institute of Smiley Study. And what I did, I wrote my master's thesis on the musical heritage of Smiley Gina. And right away I approach, um, I, you know, if you get a chance to read my master's thesis, which is also available online, I did a case study of Karachi. And these four giants, these four are my team, whom I wanted to learn and understand about their methodology of preserving and sharing the, the beautiful tradition of Gina. So I think we are running out of time. I will try to play some of their clippings, which I have gotten the permission from them to use it for academic purposes, just to, to give you an idea that how much contribution each one of them have made. Um, so next slide is, the first one is Jafar Sadiq Surmawala. Uh, wonderful teacher, late Jafar Sadiq Surmawala. He passed away um, in, I think, 2000. Uh, 10, if I'm not mistaken, a wonderful vocalist. Uh, and he popularized Ginan in, in many parts of the world. In fact, uh, many of the singers, including Khurshid, uh, Taufik Karmali, um, um, and many others, uh, uh, Muhammad Bhai, and many others have learned from Jafar Sadiq. He started his classes in Karachi around 1960. And uh, he was asked, he was approached by the leadership to, to teach Ginans. And his, his classes became so popular that the people were coming from various parts of Karachi to get enrolled in the classes. And he was very particular when it comes to the enrollment. There was a big lineup to get into his classes. He was very fond of the, the old music, such as ghazals and, and old um, old uh, filmy music. So you would, you would see that he had a refined vocal and he was also able to sing along with the musical instrument. So there were many musical methods were going on in around 16 and 70s where him and his team used to participate and perform. So when I interviewed him, he said that um, he just a little bit, let me play. Uh, hopefully uh, you will be able to hear from his mouth. Uh, and I would like my spiritual children mm -hmm. to continue this wonderful tradition mm -hmm. generation to generation for centuries. Mm -hmm. For centuries. For centuries. For centuries. This is the responsibility of the Ismaili Association. And so uh, when I interviewed him, uh, thanks to his son, who is also an amazing singer, uh, Jafar Sadiq, I interviewed this one at his uh, Jafar Sadiq's home. And I also went and visited him in Pakistan around 2002 and 3 and I, I spoke to him. So um, he was approached because he had a good voice. And he started teaching. He learned Ginans from his master's guru. And he taught them as a classroom, traditional classroom method in garden area for over 30, 35 years. And his students are all over the world. Um, and, and he said that uh, he got inspiration, of course, many of those seniors. But when he was, he felt that some of these Ginans can be, uh, can be a little bit improvise and tweak to make it more soothing to the ear. Having said that, it doesn't mean to change the tune, just to refine it. And, and he, because of his powerful projection of the voice, he was able to do so. Uh, and he has contributed immensely. So I interviewed him, what was his method? And he said he learned from his, his of course, uh, some of the older community members and he has learned and, and understand the meaning and he has taught them to his students. Now, the, the second teacher is, of course, you know, our, our legendary missionaries, Alvaiza Zarina Kamaluddin and Kamaluddin. I think they have worked immensely in this field. When I interviewed them at their residence, thanks to them, they have 
always treated us like their own children and we are their student i think their biggest contribution is that uh, through their recordings we have over 600 ginans in the recording format which is available so we can not only sing those um, popular ginans but we we can get benefit from many other ginans which they have contributed immensely so let yeah. me play um, and their method was more based on junagadh style of uh, reciting the ginans and and also to impart knowledge uh, through the 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 devotional recitation सीखे इसके बाद जब ये ट्रेडिशनल ट्यून की बात निकली तो कुछ बुजुर्गों को अप्रोच किया गया और बड़ी हैरानी की बात उस वक्त हमें हुई कि जहाँ से भी हमें मिले बुजुर्गों से कैसे मिले दो सौ के नाम से ज्यादा नहीं मिले ये नाम हमारे पास काफी आपने देख लिया तो फिर कुछ तो रात जो आते थे बाकी फिर भी किताबों से भी कन्फर्म हुआ तो कुछ जैसे पंजाब से so what uh, zarina appa has said that when they were exploring the tunes of the ginan say they couldn't find more than 200 tunes uh, which were available so she had learned from many jamaati members buzruks and but even then there were not more than 200 ginan so she has consulted some of her seniors and um, she has also learned from her ancestors and also you know uh, her upbringing and and in the style of junagar and some of the historical accounts informed us that uh, imam sultan mohammad shah once said that if you want to learn uh, the proper tunes then you may go to junagar because at that time junagar used to be um, the the central stage where many bhagats used to come and were having satsang for for weekly and and monthly basis so that was the hub at that time and imam must have mentioned that so she has taken that approach and and she also said that not more than 200 tunes were available so then you know there were some guidelines which are available in the manuscripts such as jodi laginan and many others she has she has got gotten inspiration from some of those ideas and and based on that they have also created new tunes just to make sure that we smileys have more tunes and more ginans to, to recite so that was second one was the classroom method second was uh, the junagadh and traditional tune now let's move to the third one and that is i would say a, a very learned man and i consider him kind of my father as well dr g hader ali dina marhum uh, he is also pa passed away recently and uh, i would say when it comes to understanding the shastriya sangeet classical music of our ginans no one comes to my mind more prominent than perhaps dr hader ali dina he has dedicated his entire life although he was a medical doctor but his his biggest hobby from his heart was to capture different variants different tunes of the ginan from different parts of the world and study them so let me play first uh, his methodology and we will discuss um what were his methods and how he was able to preserve and and showcase uh, the hidden uh, i would say hidden um, pearls and wisdom which are based in the music of smiley gina i would like to show you how i am doing my research work on the musicology of the ginans mm -hmm. finding out the original tunes and standardizing them mm -hmm. so, now for example this is a book which uh, i have started with uh, awa mara sami raja mm -hmm. now this is the text of the book mm -hmm. and this is uh, by mukhyani khatija hasan farmali mm -hmm. uh, cassette number this and she is from muscat mm -hmm. and she has uh, recited the sang this ginan and i have put it in the notation form mm -hmm. indian notation form and resonate here and that's in that way i have taken about 10 to 12 to 15 people mm -hmm. who have sang <coughs> awa mara sami raja mm -hmm. 
and uh, every song has been converted into the the Indian musical notations and written it here <laughs> in different pages. And then what I have done, I have uh, these are all those ones. This is number fifteen. This is number fifteen. And then I have charted them mm -hmm. like this. You know, this is by Mukshani Khatija, who is from Muscat. See, Avo Mara Sami Raja. Now under each singer, mm -hmm. the same word and the same music continues. Ava Mara here also by Bachel Ava Mara by uh, Muhammad Shaban Mukhi Ava Mara. Mm -hmm. So you know how Mukhani Khatija is singing Ava Mara pa pa ma pa, mm -hmm. and how is Bachel singing pa pa darni. Mm -hmm. So these are the different versions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what Dr. Heather, like his approach was based on uh, Shastriya Sangeet, classical music. And uh, he was emotionally and spiritually connected with the tunes of Ismaili Ginan. He was trained uh, classically by renowned uh, musicians from India and Pakistan. In fact, he was the pioneer uh, when it comes to uh, introducing orchestra in, in Ismaili world and they have played uh, music in front of Maulana Hazri Imam on various occasions. Very humble uh, human being, uh, uh, you know, uh, I've invited him and at the University of Alberta at 2011 Muslim Piety Conference as well. Um, very generous man. And his methodology was that um, what happens is because our Jamaat, when they recite certain Ginans, because they are not um, musically not musically trained, whenever they recite, not deliberately, but they somehow not 100% recite according to the, the Shastriya classical music. One or two notes are either flat or off. So what he did, he, he took uh, the, the methodology of Shastriya Sangeet and he applied all the Ginans which he wanted to study and his daughter is doing an amazing work inshallah his book will come out soon um, which his daughter is working on right now so what he did he uh, for example, Ahe Rahiman Rahiman, which is which was composed by Sayyida Imam Begum in 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 Rag Kafi Mishra Kafi and in seven beat, which is you know like uh, uh, Rupak Tal. So what he did, he he listened to the variation and different variants of that particular Ginan from different parts of the world, just to understand that how people are reciting it. Either they are reciting it according to the Shastriya Sangeet or not. If they have missed out one or two notes, it may be because of they are not they are familiar with the musical tradition. So he wanted to standardize the, the Ginanic tunes so it has the, the uh, as power as Shastriya Sangeet must have. So that was his method. So now we have studied and explored three different angles. We have studied the, the uh, traditional tune. We have studied or explored a classroom method. And the third one was Dr. Heather Lidina's Shastriya Sangeet. Now let's move quickly to the fourth one. And that is by Professor Gulam Ali Alana. Unfortunately, he has also recently passed away. Uh, a wonderful scholar. And when it comes to the scholarship of Sindhi, I think he's, he's foremost the authority. And I would highly recommend people to read his work. He's also written a book on Ginan, which is also available, a wonderful work. Um, he also was a fatherly figure to me and many others. Uh, very generous when it comes to sharing his knowledge because he knew the et etymologically um, what are the connections with the Ginan and its languages. He was able to go further, deeper. Uh, he was based in Hyderabad, Pakistan. And when I, uh, when I, interviewed him, he was able to share, share some of the insights which really guided me towards my PhD scholarship. So let's listen to what he had to say. Dusra, the Uruzi form, Farsi or Abika. This is the Mosiki. Ginan 
पहले ही से में दो दो ही फॉर्म तक तो आया है लेकिन पीर शम्स के दूसरे हिस्से से लेकर पीर ताज दिन तक पीर शम्स खसूस पीर इमाम शाह और दूसरे जितने भी पीर हैं मिठा शाह इनके जितने भी गिनान हैं इनका जो पोटिक फॉर्म है जिस पर मीटर जो है मीटर पोटिक मीटर है शालतीफ भिटाई सज्जन सर मस्त ये जितने भी हमारे या भगत कबीर या आप गुरु नानक या बाबा फरीद ये जितने भी हैं माधुल माधु लाल शाह हुसैन और सुल्तान बाहू इन सब के कलाम चलता है उनका मीटर है पोइट मीटर पोइट जो शायद जो राजधारी की मात्रा है उन पर बना हुआ है इसलिए गिनान को जब हम स्टडी करते हैं तो उसी नुक़ नगाह से म्यूजिक के मीटर को सामने रखकर उनकी जब एनालिसिस करेंगे हम छेद करेंगे तो उसी हिसाब से करेंगे कि यहाँ आपको छंद की मात्राएं काम नहीं देंगी यहाँ आपको जो रोजी शायरी गज़ल और रुबाई उनका वो जो वजन काम देगा आपको काम देगा so in a nutshell was what professor gulam ali alana was saying that when we are exploring the gnanic tradition of indian subcontinent we need to be mindful of not only exploring the gnan from the poetical meters but also from the musical meters and he compare that with other forms such as when you are talking about ghazal ghazal is the poetical meter poetical form qasida is the poetical meter but when we are talking about gnan Ginan doesn't have only one form of poetical meter; it is the musical genre. Same is like when you are talking about Kavali. Kavali does have many poetical meters, but you won't be able to say that only this is the way in which Kavali is always sung. Kavali is the musical genre. Same as Kafi, Wai, Geet, all of them are musical genres. Okay. which follows many different style of poetical meters to perform and if you look at ginans we have ginans written in in doha two liner ginans we have four liner five liner many different poetical forms which are used employed by our peer to compose ginans but they are also based on the musical meters so if we need to study the ginan we need to understand the regional tunes and he felt that many of the ginans and he he is also mentioned that um, if you look at um, our ginan asha ji anant akhado which we recite he says that ginan has connection with kafi genre when i was interviewing abda parveen she mentioned the same thing um, there is a very good book i would highly recommend you to read it's called pakistan mein tehzeeb ka irtaka by sapte hasan he also mentioned that that the earliest uh, punjabi poet according to him a sabaga and a katirat sarai ki poet was peer shams and he also mentioned that the earliest sindhi poet was peer sadardin and he mentioned about his ginan utthi allana guri banda which were played before the session was begin so now when you look at these four different case study you you would realize that when we are talking about ginans we are talking about not only one composer it started from peer sadgu noor all the way to sayyid imam begum we are talking about 700 years of history we are talking about more than 20 composers come from various cultural background linguistic background they were also influenced by the 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 background they were coming from their their musical style their literary style their religious style so when we are talking about ginan we are talking about many layers of meaning devotional spiritual meaning which one can learn from of course the layers of meaning from the the powerful poetry but also the way it has been preserved orally from generation to generation okay so what i did in my master's thesis i i studied these four different school of thought again tradi traditional classroom method um uh, traditional um, tunes um then the shastriya sangeet and then i wanted to compare them that you know how we can find uh, 
the authentic raga because what happens you know being in, in academic world i think we are always always looking for the answers no no we need to find same as traditionalists we want to find what is the truth there what is really right but to to give you the answer to this humanity doesn't work that way humanity social sciences doesn't work in black and white okay uh, humanity and social sciences there are many truth there are many ways people are able to embrace and learn and share their affinity and connection with the devotional literature they are connected with so what i did i compare one ginan a beautiful ginan written by sayyid fazal shah aankh ladi joi joi tha ki so you know i transcribed them and i studied them both from you know like uh, shastriya sangeet and the local uh, music from the region so the hyderabadi dinas version which is available uh, you can you can uh, hear his version available on youtube i have it here as well but i think because of the time i perhaps may not be able to play the piece uh, but you will be able to understand where i am coming from so his piece was uh, composed in uh, raga jinjoti which um, which is from the khamach thad um then i analyze zarina kamaluddin alwaiza zarina kamaluddin's recitation of um, aankh ladi joi joi tha ki uh, that was based on raga bilawal so raga bilawal has all seven no natural notes when we are talking about khamaj it has six ascending and seven descending note one note is missing so completely different rag um you can also hear this recording from their collection from jafar sadik surma wala he had two um different um tunes for this particular ginan one was which he introduced for mahfil when they were performing with the musical instrument and that is based on raga bhairavi and another one is completely different rag not jinjoti not bilawal because certain notes were missing um and then i studied the east african style where where i have conducted my field research in in kenya uh in 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 tanzania in other parts of africa uh they usually sing in in raga mishra bhairavi and i found i found some of the influences from again some of the bollywood style as well and not only that particular ginan i remember a beautiful ginan um which uh, which usually i have heard in in jamaat khanas based on bollywood movie o duniya ke rakhwale raag darbari which goes ओ दुनिया के रख वाले एंड 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 द गिनान इज दर्द बरे मेरे नाले मालख जीना बहुत जबरी या मालख जीना so one can see that the, the other influences are also coming in but having said that there were some amazing singers and musicians from east africa who have also contributed immensely towards the understanding of the ginans so here you know i had uh, their performances um uh, in the video format which i won't be able to play i think uh, my slides have stuck here please bear with me for a moment uh, i'm sorry about that let me uh, put on my presentation again okay uh okay so so i would highly recommend you to to listen to aankh ladi joi joi tha ki um recitation from all other schools which are available um in their own work and compare them um maybe next time when we have more time i would be able to play those tunes uh, which i have have it here and then i also conducted ethnographic field research in multan uh, talwandi which is the oldest uh, 
uh, Ismaili community there who have migrated from Multan, uh, Sin, Sakhro, uh, Karachi, Pir Sadadin Shrine. Uh, I also interviewed some of the older community member, uh, uh, such as late Mukhi Juma Qasim, um, Alwais Muhammad Ayub, uh, many of the scholars from, from that region. Uh, I also um, went uh, into some other mazar, such as Baba Bulle Shah, such as Sarmas, uh, interviewed some of their masters, some of the, the, some of the temples, uh, just to understand the musical meters and the connections which they have with their devotional music, which was very close to the way we revered and love our devotional tradition. And apart from that, uh, for my PhD, when I expanded my, my, my area of study into uh, not only uh, uh, doing the field research or a case study of Karachi, now I wanted to explore much larger framework. I was able to guide it by some of these people. There are many others which I was unable to put it in my screen, but I would like to name them. Some of them which are very important, such as Professor Regula Barkat Qureshi, Professor Zim Nanji, Professor Asani, um, some of the renowned singer, Shamshu, uh, late Shamshu Jamal, Taufik Bhai, uh, Khushi Daba, Christina Nelson. Um, we have here uh, the father of Kamal Taj, um, uh, and, 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 and many others. So these were the people whom I've interviewed just to explore and understand what they think about the tunes of the Ginan and also some of the field research which I've conducted over two years of my time in different parts of uh, Pakistan particularly and, and explore them and study them. Okay. Um, when I was interviewing Abda Parveenji, um, you know, both Abda Parveen and uh, Alan Fakir, um, they have sung Ginan in the presence of uh, Molana Hazar Imam. Um, and it was before 2000 because Alan Fakir died. If you go on YouTube and uh, hear their recordings, they have sung in a very traditional method. Uh, although Abda Parveen, when I interviewed her, she sang I Rahman Rahman in Rag Malkos, which is not the way we sing in Jamaat Khana. We sing in Rag Kafi. Uh, so when I interviewed her, why did you sing in Rag Malkos? So she said that, you know, this is the tune which my father has taught me. And when I read uh, some of the verses from written by Sayyid Imam Begum, it, it really moved me. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to put out uh, in 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 Rag Malkos because I felt that it would communicate much better in my own way. But when I heard later on um, the composition of um, Sayyid Imam Begum, I felt that I was perhaps wrong. Sayyid Imam Begum had done an amazing and spiritual um, work with that particular Ginan. So when I interviewed her, I asked her after hearing the tunes of Ginan, do you believe that their composers were trained in the poetic and musical traditions of Sindh, Punjab and Gujarat? And, and this was her answer. She said, I have no doubt that they were well versed in the poetical and musical traditions of South Asia in the same manner as the other great Sufis of this region. Their poetry and beautiful tunes are witnesses of their deepest knowledge of our cultural culture and language. How can one write poetry and compose so beautifully without knowing the musical and poetic languages and culture? Similarly, all of these poets such as Waris Shah, Shah Latif, Bulle Shah, Pir Sadardin, Peer Shams and even Guru Nanak Ji, Meera Bhai, they were all divinely inspired people who chose music as a tool to their messages of peace, love and humanity. So being a renowned Sufi artist, she was able to understand Ginan within the wider context of Sufi literature in South Asia. And when she mentioned about some of these people, such as Shah Latif, and when I studied Shah Latif, you know, his Risalo, Shah, uh, Shah Jo Risalo, it's an amazing example. One can go and, and, and look at it, and you would find a lot of connections with Ginan. What Shah Latif did, and if you happen to visit Bit Shah, where his shrine is, even this day, age, and time, Fakir, uh, like those devotees, perform his vice along with Tanbura, Tanbura, 
tanpura is the indian instrument and he created tambura which has more string and they they sing his own voice his shahjo risalo interestingly very interestingly he he chose 16 shastriya sangeet ragas based on indian classical ragas and 16 folk tunes he he used 32 different maqams to compose his voice and he did mention in one of his his couplet that when he was composing them they were in, inspired by the by the divine that he could not find the proper tune which communicate with them so these were the tunes which he got inspiration from and he put out his entire risalo into 32 different musical meters similarly if you look at um, another work uh, which she has also mentioned guru nanak ji guru garang sa you would find the similar similar ragas have written there and if you look at ismaili manuscripts particularly harvard manuscript you would also find some kind some of the names of the ragas are written there in the manuscript so it's very interesting we really need to understand ginan within the larger social cultural context to have a deeper understanding of of this uh, heritage which we have um here you know when we are talking about the performance context we have many other ways of knowing about the contribution from the ginans uh, we have of course trained professional musicians abda parveen ragishwari and many others who have who have also sung ginans um then there are classically trained ismaili singers who have also sung ginan such as shamshuddin jamal ji hader ali dina khurshid nur ali and many others then we have trained western classical musicians who have also uh, been inspired by the ginanic tunes and they have created their own uh, expression of of ginans then we have new age musician now because of uh, because of now the contemporary times how through youtube and many other uh, mode people are expressing their devotion and love to ginan that is also there and then we have also uh, you know, some of the ginans which are coming from from our institutions um so this slide uh, dr uh, ali asani has also shown in his last presentation so when we are talking about ginan we must 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 understand that ginan is not the devotional genre which we only perform inside the jamaat khana okay it has the larger framework it has a larger performing context okay one is inside the jamaat khana in a liturgical worship sacred space and another one is the private public space in which we sing ginan as part of lalabai when our children are going to sleep we sing for them okay when our children are born we feel happy we sing dhana dhana so ginan plays much more and much powerful role than only in the sacred space so when we are studying ginan we need to look into different contexts and understanding otherwise we will be puzzled between this question of right and wrong black and white we need to really come out of this and we need to understand uh, in a deeper way to appreciate its beauty and aesthetic now let's rethink when we are talking about the music of smiley ginans then where we can situate ginan um, you know like within the larger framework of of the the music from indian subcontinent so here is the chart which i have developed if you look at the indo pakistan musical categories you would find on top there are shastriya sangeet uh, in shastriya sangeet you have north india south india bismillahir rahmanir rahim allahumma bismillahir rahmanir rahim allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad wa ala ali muhammad wa ala ali muhammad wa ala ali muhammad okay and uh, then there is a folk and traditional category there is a semi classical and light classical music and then if you follow semi classical and light classical music category here you would find ghazal geet rubai and then there is a devotional music category and then in the devotional music categories you have uh, of course a range of uh, music uh, from indian subcontinent starting from marsia and noha azan nath hamd ginan those are the ones which usually we recite not accompanied with the musical instrument but having said that remember human voice is the oldest musical instrument in the in the world music 
always follow the human voice it's not other way around so when we sing in an itself it's music yes it is not accompanied with the musical instrument but we always sing in tune okay so and then the rest is kafi kawali shabad kirtan so ginan we we are able to situate somewhere in the devotional category and then within ginan of course there are sub genres such as aarti vinti garbi garant munajat jogriya and all of them follow certain musical meters which we can quickly browse through them if we have time okay so so the first category sub category is is garbi we know we have um garbis which were written by peer shams only and um all of these garbis uh, as we know uh, historically as as we have the traditional memory i would use not the historical memory but traditional memory that peer shams was visiting anilwad in gujarat where he saw that people were performing garba and then he composed a range of garbis and 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 he composed them according to the indian meters garbis okay and and in 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 gujarat interestingly their regional music is called dhal music again i would um, i would invite you to read gordon thompson's work he wrote um, a, a wonderful work on dhal music from gujarat in which he has studied the dhal music the dhal music is very unique it doesn't take all the element from shastriya sangeet it is itself is a very unique genre and our ginans especially our garbis ginans are based on dal musical meter garba musical meters i have a example here from shabnam merali whom i interviewed a while back a wonderful singer uh then we have venti ginans so usually venti ginans are like alap if you know in shastriya sangeet little bit alap is the form of a uh, type of a kind of music which usually happens at the beginning of any song or bandesh and in alap you don't have any of those meters you don't play drums with it so when we sing alap such as venti ginan it is very soothing very soulful and it is like a alap but we do follow certain musical meters with it okay so venti ginans have a lot of um inspiration comes from from the the alap musical style um then we have larger uh, compositions which are garanth there are many many garanths and this term garanth remind me of the punjabi word garanth um Uh, which is of course uh, guru nanak's work and we have you know like many of the granth uh, which are the longer poems longer ginans it uh, like we have for example uh, we have um, this ginan uh, which we recite before our first dua anant akharo which is also a part of granth it has 500 stanzas so granth usually follow a, a term which i would like to use here which is uh, a difference between sur and raga okay um this is a little bit technical but let me try to explain what i mean by that shah abdul latif bitai also used the term sur sur has the fixed melody raga changes okay and if i have time i will demonstrate at the end what i mean by raga raga follow the certain rules but you can freely compose any song if you follow the rule so for example if we are talking about just like to give you an example if you are talking about uh, an evening raga which is rag eman or yaman yaman kalyan we have many songs which are written in yaman and ginan beautiful ginan um sahib ji tu more man bag was composed in rag yaman you know it has a lot of devotion and love and another ginan meetha naam mohammad ka rag yaman now if you compare their tune with lal meri pat which is also composed in rag yaman but completely different way one one perform that particular song aaj jaane ki zid na karo which swil rana composes a famous nazam very different meter so raga follow certain rules but 
there is a room for improvise and compose the way you would like to compose in one rag you can compose thousands of tunes and each tune may be completely different but when you are talking about sur sur has the fixed melody it follows the certain fixed melody and you can apply that fixed melody into different genres so when we are talking about granth they follow the fixed melody of sur in throughout the granth if you sing one stanza in 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 one way it will continue until the 500 stanza in most cases okay so musical references in the gnanic repertoire there are many gnans in which um, the the references of the 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 musical meters are mentioned in fact sayeda imam begum was a uh, accomplished musician she used to play sarangi a bow instrument while she was composing her song uh, you know first of uh, her gnans first of her gnan ag hardam jampo peer shano naam here she uses uh, some of the symbolic language uh, to explain the ginan such as play the spiritual instrument of zikr given by a true guide within your being and adorn your thought with it um then uh, later she says sing without mouth hear without the ear and play the rhythm without the hands play the rhythm on pakhavaj dol mridangam another kind of drum and keep on praising without the tongue so some of these symbolic language one can find which is used in the gnanic language in bharam prakash uh, p shams also mentioned about where continuous or uh, kisless spiritual instruments are played that is the sound of the flute or flageolet where there is the luminosity of light that is the very light of the sun so there are many references of musical instrument and musical meters in the gnanic repertoire um there are more gnans you know older ginan the savtara one can find this so the noise perhaps the right translation of jankar would be the musical sound of one and the quarter crores of white shells um and then there is a mention of the bell uh, veena the oldest indian instrument shastriya sangeet instrument uh, aesthetic plays of veena has been mentioned uh, the other uh, instruments have a matchless sound um, and and the sound and the symbols are also mentioned the big drum damaru has mentioned um uh, then we have uh, the beat seven drums blue trumpet and and guru sound and many of those references are already mentioned in the gnanic repertoire now when we are talking about the the gnans and how we are able to understand them uh when we look at some of the manuscripts i did mention that in the howard collection um in the manuscript some of the ragas are mentioned on top of the book such as raga dhoro raga kal uh, raga chalti uh, dhal raga dhal which i mentioned which is from the gujarat region um, there are uh, vivano ginan sadgurno ginan dhol jankar garbi all of these one can find in the manuscript raga raga subha subano ginan raga sham no evening no ginan subu sanju jo ginan and all of these uh, give us the direction towards where these these music may have come from in shastra sangeet you have morning ragas evening ragas and all that but interestingly some of these um, like for example uh, vivano ginan and raga kal and raga chalti and all that in present day and time some of these ragas are not there so it may have because of historically the way the manuscript was preserved may have missed out the full information or these may have been the term during the time these ginans were written down in manuscripts then what are the other method through which the ginans have been preserved for century we know that there are prabhatiyo subha sadikno ginan and sandhyo evening ginans so we have evening chogadiyos we have morning chogadiyos these have been the i think the tradition from from many many generation and then interestingly very interestingly if you get a chance uh, uh, there is a book uh, which was uh, written by uh, lalji bhai devraj in 1905 and this is called raga mala garland of ragas tunes in this particular book uh, when lalji bhai devraj was compiling the ginans from different parts of the world one thing which struck him was that now we have the text poetry 
how people are going to remember the tunes and that was his question so with the help of some bhagats he put together this book called raga mala which is available we have in coach ki and he mentioned about jodi la ginans for example he come up, come up with certain signs you would see one sign here ginan ananta khado and ananna chuga have the same symbol that means they are based on jodi la gina one term which people use uh, which is very common which is called stock tunes and this idea of using the stock tunes is very common among south asian devotional tradition just to give you an example ali antarma mara we sing this geet and we really love this geet this geet is based on lal meri pat rakhiyo wala there are many such geet which we sing halo halo it is based on gujarati folk tunes so it's not about stealing or copying tunes this is this is the idea of stock tunes is an inspiration which comes from the region there are many tunes which becomes popular and people try to write poetry according to those tune and compose and share their love and devotion so he uses this idea and it was always there in the manuscript as well which is called jodi la ginans and we have many such ginans um so if you get a chance uh, look into the raga mala as well okay so while i was studying different uh, ginans uh, i was really astonished and i was struck by the poetical and musical meters in which some of these ginans were written there is a author called aga salim um those who read urdu may be able to find some of his work um he believes and when i was studying them from musical meters he said many of our ginans are based on kafi and beth tradition and the first ginan which i have mentioned here is noor avera noor apio this ginan if you compare them musically it is based on the beth meter uh if you compare the wai tradition which is very popular in the sindh region uh ai rahman rahman although it is based on shastriya sangeet but its influence is coming from the wai musical meters from sindh and here i have anecdoted this particular if you look at kafi many of our ginans are based on ismaili kafi aga salim in his book mentioned the word kafi comes from kawafi which means rhymes and he said i quote when ismaili dais came to sindh they use indic hindu metaphors to propagate the essential messages of the faith of islam and carefully chose vernacular languages to compose a vast repertoire called ginan if we carefully analyze the poetical meters of peer sadardeen's ginan we would know that they are mostly based on kafi style instead of persian poetical forms they are essentially written in musical and rhythmic meters of sindh these ginans used to be sung in various tunes and even today kafis are sung in various forms of ragas ej utthi alana gure banda which we played earlier when alan fakir sang he 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 was inspired by the kafi tradition and he sang it in the kafi style of sindh region let me wrap it up i think uh, because of the interest of time so what next what what needs to be done next you know and what have i done so far um what i have done i wanted to uh, share some of the work with utmost humility uh, which i have been doing for the last two decades and and i'm thankful to many teachers who have given me this this and shared their knowledge and i've shared some of their knowledge here when we are talk, talking about ginans we need to understand that ginan is not only ismaili khoja tradition it is the much larger context in which we need to study ginans there were mahamargis there were satpanthis there were bharmartis there were sufis there are some sufis even this day and time in peer sadadin shrine who are also singing ginans if i have opportunity next time i will play some of their videos so we need to understand that 
the the genre of ginan has the much larger influence than only a genre which is accompanied and held by smileys we need to understand that second we don't need to find answers when it comes to no only this raga is proper or this is right raga or this is wrong raga we really need to come out of this when nusrat fateh ali khan sing the same composition mera piya ghar aaya okay or when he sings cheti uh, aavi mein tabiba bhai bulle shah when abda parveen sing the same kaafi she sang in a completely different style we really don't need to be hard and fast in our own understanding and which i have seen throughout my field research and especially in multan and other places where uh, people have told me in front of camera that they were stop in various places not to recite their ginas because they were told that your recitation is wrong i think we need to come out of this when we are talking about ginans it shares many spiritual and cultural and 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 linguistic ideas from from uh, south asia if in multan in talwandi people are reciting ginan the way they have been taught by their forefathers i think that's where the beauty is let them be if we are talking about punjabi ginan perhaps that would be the better source to go and research rather than going to the gujarat and if you want to study gujarat then uh, gujarati ginan perhaps gujarat might be the right place to go to so i think we need to come out of this misunderstanding which has created certain issues and problems in the past no 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 you know this is right this is wrong i think this is where the beauty is ginan shares many of this cultural understanding which perhaps is much deeper than our arguments before i end what needs to be understand concepts to consider areas to further explore globalization versus glocalization um hegemony and influences when we are talking about ginans we need to understand their local local element the influence of the local element and their global impact why am i saying that in northern areas of pakistan for example if people are performing qasidas accompanied with rubab in their own personal places and they feel connected with it then let it be that's where the beauty is okay we don't have to be very vocal towards what we understand being in perhaps in bombay or karachi and that's where the cultural memory really generates when molana hazri mam visited first time in 1995 in tajikistan the people of tajikistan has given imam a rubab as a gift and they told imam that through the teaching of nasir e khusro through the rubab we have kept our faith for generation music plays much bigger role than our personal perhaps uh, work either of mine or anybody else and it carries it it cross many boundaries and it it connects people with their heart and soul we need to let them be connected we need to preserve them having said that that doesn't mean that we allow everything and anything as i given you the example of bollywood influences we need to stay away from it but we also need to preserve the way ginan has been passed down from generation to generation from punjab from sindh from gujarat from kathiawar and many other you know immigrant communities in east africa in in canada in us in europe and that's where the journey comes that's where the beauty comes second is cultural hegemony versus local and regional context we need to understand that um ginans can be further compared with offshoot ismaili communities and i was talking to meera and others and they have also encountered encountered the same experience uh, that is also area I, which i have studied briefly but that can be further studied that how satpanthi ismailis or mahapanthis or barmatis or shamsis are reciting ginans and what are their ragas and how they feel connected with their recitation versus us that is another area we can also explore the evolution of the music and languages of the ginan the the languages of the ginans and the music also has evolved over the period of time i think that can be a fascinating study as well um another area which really fascinates me is the role of ginan in contemporary times and recently i was talking to taufik bhai and he he mentioned that because he has been living here in the west and he understand that how our children 
who are not living in an indic environment where he they don't have any connection with indian culture or indian music how we are going to motivate them and what are their inspiration i think this is this is an amazing area which can be explored especially the the migration last 30 years of ismaili migrating from east africa pakistan to many western countries um then the spaces of performances of ginan migration diaspora and then now the the new category world music which is becoming really big and people have also categorized ginan as part of world music personally i don't like this idea you know we don't have to say that mcdonald is global we don't have to journalize things sometimes journalizing any area can cause more harm to the the culture rather than enriching it we need to keep it the way it is um and then i think the the most important part what does the technological changes of the past 10 15 years mean to the international performers musicians and for that i will share this slide commodification of music professor amy kathleen has done an amazing work on that uh this is this is a fascinating work you can read her article which was published i think in 2002 if i'm not mistaken at the ethnomusicology journal and commodification of music is how music has been captured historically like and and has become a part of commodity so if you look at it from 1870 wax cylinders came phonograph came in 1890 and and then you you look at many other phases and now itunes youtube and many other things so i think this is also a fascinating area how because these ginans were written way earlier than any of these commodification of music so this is a fascinating area to understand how uh, ginanic music has been commodified and and become a part of this this um, you know uh, the recent contemporary times before i end i would like to end with two quotes plato once said music is a moral law it gives soul to the universe wings to the mind flight to the imagination and charm and gaiety to life and to everything and at the end i would like to quote with three um three quotes um which is very important and i will leave this question to you all uh, to think about it when you when you think about the music of smiley ginan and the question is does music evolve and adopt according to different time and perhaps recreate redefine itself and create new meanings and interpretations when i was interviewing professor azim nanji from he 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 was working at the institute of smiley studies uh, a guru a guide he said to me diversity is built in the ginan tradition so it is not a question of saying we should not have diversity it is already there and part of it is that diversity develops over the period of time we do not have recordings of the earlier renditions and i think even if we were able to get the recordings of the earliest ones you would already find that diversity is embedded and just as there is diversity in the way linguistically ginans were appropriated a quote from bruno natal and i will end that and that is the central idea which i have shared today to many of you and i hope you have understand and appreciate the work which i have shared bruno natal in his book said each music has its own history and in the sense that all go back to and are in time equally removed from the point of music's origin all have a history equally long they took different courses some changing more quickly than others thank you very much thank you dr gilani for uh, such a wonderfully insightful and interesting presentation um it was fascinating to hear about your personal journey and growth um as well as your contribution in this little studied area of musicology of ginans um it was enlightening to know about the people who contributed so much in the field of ginans such as uh, the late jafar sadik surmawala alwaiz azarina kamaluddin and alwaiz kamaluddin 
Dr. Heather Ali Dina and Professor Gulam Ali Alana. These were giants indeed. Um, you've highlighted the significance of hearing, reciting, performing practices within the Indo-Muslim context. Uh, and also you talked very beautifully about the ragas and, and, and the poetic meters and how during the, the several generations that the peers have developed these compositions of Ganans, that they've used these, uh, these beautiful uh, rags and, and meters of the local, within, the lo within their local contexts. Um, from Sindh, Punjab, Gujarat, you mentioned about the Dhal tradition, etc. Um, so thank you, it was a, it was a wonderful uh, um, presentation. Unfortunately, we won't have time for your presentation, for your musical presentation, because we have run way beyond time. <laughs> but we'll have a brief question and answer session. Um, so let me just go directly into the question answer, uh, questions, uh, questions which uh, a lot of people have asked. Uh, one of the questions I have here is, uh, do we have any examples of instruments other than the voice, which were used as devotional expressions during the time of uh, the Holy Prophet, or also if the peers have used or manufactured themselves uh, during the time when they were writing Ginans? Do we, do we have any records of? This is an excellent question. Thanks for asking. So it is about the instrumental music and its role. I did mention about the role of Rubab uh, in, in Tajikistan and in, in Central Asian Ismailis. Uh, one can find the role of Rubab also uh, in Guru Garan Sahib, in Sikh tradition. Interestingly, when Guru Nanak, uh, he was, you know, his teachers were some of the Sufi, Sufi masters. Um, and when he was writing his poetry, he had a Muslim uh, um, musician. His name was Mardana. Who, who used to accompany him and compose his tunes. And if you look at the same, same style, Peer Shams, when he went to Anilwad, he composed uh, his garbis based on the dhal music of Gujarat. He didn't do something completely different because people feel connected with the tradition which speaks to them. Absolutely. And when Sayyidah Imam Begum composed her beautiful ginans, you know, many of her ginans are composed in Raag Kafi, beautiful and the meters the way she has used like you know it's, it's mind blowing there are stories traditional stories i don't know um you know we don't have the historical anecdotes to prove some of those uh, oral memories but i think they play a big role let me share it one um and which is that sayyida imam begum there was there was a time of uh, uh, Hassan Ali Shah, uh, our, our first Aga Khan, and what happened was that um, due to some misunderstanding, um, our first Aga Khan, he was not um, very happy with Sayyid Imam Begum. Um, and Sayyid Imam Begum was really shattered and broken and she really wanted to plead and, you know, be humble and be devoted and, you know, to, to ask her for mercy. And that's where she composed Ginan Ay Rahe Rahman. And the story goes, and again, I'm saying historically, we don't have any data to prove, but the way I have been told by some of our missionaries that Sayyidah Imam Begum composed that ginan in Raag Kafi, a beautiful ginan, and he sat outside her home and she went closer to where the home of the Imam was. She played Sarangi in Raag Kafi, which is usually performed in the evening. And she sang, I Rahman, Rahman, up to Rahim Karo. Oh, merciful, please, you know, give your mercy to me. And the story goes when, you know, she, she was crying, she was pleading. When she finished her ginan, Imam came out from his home. Beautiful. <laughs> you know, and there are many such stories, you know, like if you look at the Kafi tradition of Baba Bulesha, you know, Cheti Avi Me Tabiba Naita Me Margaya, it has the similar, similar story that um, Baba Bulesha. Uh, had a had a master called Shai Nayat. And Baba Bulesha was very vocal. So Shai Nayat told him that, listen, you don't have to be vocal with other people. They won't understand what the reality is. They will, they will claim to you that you are kufar. Just, you know, be, be whatever you are within yourself. Don't proclaim that, oh, you, you have seen the light and this and that. So, but Baba Bulesha was perhaps very vo vocal. And in one of the places, he did say something like that in the market, in the bazaar. And some of Baba Bulle Shah's colleague, they were jealous of him. And they went to Shah Inayat and they said, listen, you told Baba Bulle Shah not to say those spiritual ideas, share those spiritual ideas with others. And he's doing it in the market. This is not right. 
what needs to be done here so shai inayat really got upset and shai inayat told baba bhule shah from now onwards i am not going to look to you you are not going to learn from me and there was a period of about 7 years or so where uh, baba bhule shah and his journey mystical journey was very disturbed same is like rumi and shams i think separation plays a very key role there when sham ignite the light into rumi and got disappear that's where where the light really showers you know the the poetry really blossoms so what happened for seven seven years uh, baba bulle shah didn't have anything you know he, he was looking from places to places to meet his master and he knew his master is not going to meet him so one day what he did he came to know that in one of the festival shah inayat is coming so he knew that he is going to be there so what he did he changed his get up and he changed his get up to a female from male to female he put bagels gungru in in his feet and at the festival he started to sing and dance che tiya vive tabhi ba nahi to main mar gaya tere ishq na chaya tere ishq na chaya tere ishq na chaya karke thaiya thaiya oh spiritual master okay please come tere because of your love i am dancing in ecstasy please give me your shadow okay please take me under your protection and when shainath heard this particular song right away he know he knew that this is bullesha he went to bullesha he embraced him and he brought him together in his class so yes musical instruments um some of these stories some of these devotion uh, play a uh, a much bigger role towards the devotion of our our, our communities thank you dr gilani i have another questions do the ginans have a vedic musical and cultural context okay so let me try to answer this you know many people think that when we try to attach some of the historical context with any piece it becomes more useful if i would say oh it is based on sanskrit that means it is more meaningful if it is based in vedic parat it it is it is more valuable you know culture doesn't work that way you know there is a beautiful article by carol barbriaki and amy kathlin and regular burkard qureshi and many of many of other latest ethnomusicologists have written about uh, you know uh, folk traditions versus classical tradition many of these classical gurus in this day and time have taken folk tunes inspired by folk tunes and now they are claiming these are their own ragas which historically was not the case so what am i trying to say is when we say vedic when we say sanskrit when we say arabic it is not making anything special to that particular thing and let me give you an example when we say sindhi behrvi for example yeah it was a regional tune and it was later developed as part of the shastriya sangeet when we are so talking about um, you know like rag multani it was a multani tune which was which was performed and, and sung for generations in multan and it it later on became a part of shastriya sangeet so folk tradition local tradition perhaps is even more powerful than many of these vedic tradition so so just to give you that that glimpse that uh, we need to understand the the context in which these ginans were written yes uh, there are vedic inspiration in 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 the uh, in the poetical style and in the poetical symbols in the ginans because our peer encountered that within the cultural context but if you ask me musically i would say no thank you dr glani i have another question and this is a bit uh, personal to me and i've been meaning to ask you this question um you know in certain countries especially in india uh, you know, we are told to recite in a particular standardized raga of teaching and i myself was a gnana trainer and i remember teaching in a standardized form uh, which was uh, by our tarika board and um i'm i'm just wondering so if people have different if if people want to recite in a particular raga which was you know taken from somewhere else and people enjoy reciting that particular raga um do, do you think that you know is basically my question is do you think standardization of ganan is the right approach to be honest if you are asking my own personal 
answer to this question i would say no um i have the recordings of junagar i have the recordings of bombay india i have the recordings of punjab sindh uh, and many immigrant communities in the last 20 years even their ragas have also been um, shaped by some of the recent influences when we play this game and i'm i'm saying it that way and and you would find not only in our community in 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 a larger framework as well oh you know during the time of prophet muhammad these songs were not sung you know going back to traditionalist approach everything looking at it from the time of prophet muhammad there were no cars there either there were no planes there either okay we need and understand the evolution if we are not understanding the evolution of languages music culture then we are making a huge difference what my personal take would be and i'm again i'm 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 a student of this area i don't know anything this is just a tiny drop which i was able to study in the last 20 odd years there will be many others who will come and explore the rich diversity of ginan much more than what i have done is just the first step okay what i would humbly suggest that you need to take the evolution approach how these ginans have evolved in their own local communities such as punjab sindh you know bombay hyderabad and one has to be mindful of the influences as i said about bollywood influences and many other my ad- personal advice and suggestion would be after studying perhaps a range of many recordings i have interviewed over 500 people and still i am interviewing so what i am trying to say is let it be the way the traditions are evolving in their own local local fabric don't impose an idea on them it is same as like if i want to do a development work i am using the development model from europe and i am applying to northern areas of pakistan this is not going to work the context of northern areas of pakistan is different the mindset is different the language is different we need to understand the local context and we need to preserve these ginans as i said how how lucky we are that sapte hasan who is not an ismaili he is saying that our peers have contributed immensely when it comes to the cultural and political heritage of the of the uh, of the civilization of pakistan and he mentioned uthialana gurebanda is one of the earliest ginan written by peer sadardin peer shams ginan for example a sabaga was the earliest punjabi poem think about it in that context we need to perhaps come out of this you know this argument and if there is an argument like that then we need to justify that argument if somebody says that okay don't recite in so and so way then what are the methods in which that authority is coming in what, what are the tools in which that person is saying no 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 wait this is exactly the way this ginan should be sung as i said ginans are based on many many cultural and political and musical influences such as shastriya sangeet wai kafi dhal and many others it basically be- basically is 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 there a right way of of is there one particular raga of a ginan because i this have is, from what i understand this is the wrong question this is the wrong question to ask exactly from because your your presentation itself talked about uh, the ginan uh, which mewari wari with four different ragas i would say we don't need to we don't need to you know we don't we don't need to go into that that direction by doing that you know what happens to art what is the difference between music and poetry music speaks the language of heart when you try to frozen music into one canon it dies music is the soul of spirituality what music does music touches people regardless of their color creed caste religion when when indian bollywood singers i i've given the mention some of the names 
Abda Parveen and all of them, when they got inspired by the teachings of Ginan, yes, poetry played a key role, but it was their music which really moved them. We don't need to freeze music which is beyond boundaries. Music is like a water which flows from one place to another and it comes from another place. Our dawa may have started from Multan, went to Rajasthan, then came down to Sindh and then went to Gujarat. It has taken the influence from different languages and that's where the beauty is. Regular Qureshi, one, one of the foremost ethnomusicologists, when she encountered Ginan, she was fascinated. She says, how beautifully these Ginans are composed. In one of the Ginans, you would find seven different languages. How pluralistic our peer and our people must have been. Not only the, to adopt some of the regional influences and languages, but also the music. Absolutely. And that's where the beauty is. Just let it be. But try to avoid some of, some of you know, like, as I said, uh, some of rap and Bollywood and all that. Some can even argue, why, why not rap? Why not Bollywood? And my personal answer to them would be, that when you compose, being a composer myself, I look at it that text is a body and tune is the soul. Okay. Tune and text, they correspond together. Let's say if I take the text of one Ginan, Sahib Ji, and if I take the tune from Bollywood, soul from Bollywood and text from Ginan. Now what happens? They don't coordinate well together. Okay. And why they don't coordinate well together? There is a, there is a reason for it. Because the musical, musical style from Bollywood was composed in certain contexts for, for certain people, for certain idea in which that was composed. And the Ginan, which we are talking about, was composed in certain, certain contexts. And it, it has happened with many other people, like, for example, you know, um, this Ginan, Sahib Jitu Moreman Bhave, the way we sing, you know, Sahiba. And I've heard the Bollywood version of it as well. Sahib Jitu Moreman Bhave, Mola Jitu Moreman Bhave. How this tune, which is, is the human the love, is going to correspond with the, the spiritual words. And when the same question was asked to, to uh, Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, he was really disturbed. Because many of his songs were plagiarized by Bollywood. For example, the Mas Kalandar Mas, he's talking about Lal Shahbaz Kalandar and Ali. And it was poorly copied, plagiarized by Bollywood, to cheese badi a Mas Mas. It is talking about, you know, date and, and, and many other human we love. And then he composed, he, he sang this traditional tune, Mera Piya Garaya, which was written by Baba Bulle Shah. Oh, Lalni. He was talking about God. It was poorly plagiarized in, in, in Bollywood. Mera Piya Garaya, oh Ramji. And, and then we have dance and club and all that. So what I'm trying to say, and we need to explain this to our younger generation, that music, as I said, it's a soul. Words are the body, it has to correspond together. When a composer composes a music, why Aankhladi Joy Jai Thaki still moves us? Why Sahib Ji still moves us? Because it was beautifully composed to echo the sentiments in which it was written. Thank you so much, Doctor. That was really enlightening. I have one, uh, a couple of questions, but one of the last questions I have is, uh, you know, there's usually this questions about you, the use of musical instruments in, in Ginans. Um, so there's always, uh, you know, people are, especially smileys are a little uh, skeptical or they're, they're unsure about whether to use musical instruments uh, in the context of the Ginans. Do you, what is your own view? Okay, so... You know, historically, we may have some, as, as I've mentioned, some examples of the Ginans where musical instruments were mentioned. Sayyida Imam Begum used to accompany Sarangi while she was composing because being a composer, when I compose this, I use keyboard and harmonium to compose it because you need some musical instrument to, to you know, get the, the right uh, mode, raga, makam, beat. So now when we're talking about sacred spaces within Jamaat Khana, it is very important to understand that being a part of Muslim community, 
we are shia ismaili muslim community in 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 islam in in general the places of worship such as mosque okay such as kaaba such as jamaat khana historically they don't appreciate or allow musical instrument to be performed inside the jamaat khana we need to understand historically how these ideas have evolved and developed over the time but in a social hall you can play music there is nothing wrong with it okay and and in in your private spaces i'm not talking about sacred spaces in your public space you can you can definitely play along with the musical instrument that is going to enlighten you like now when i study music i every day i learn something new because i have a harmonium to 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 know where these musical meters are going so we need not to be puzzled and and as, as i said in my presentation human voice is the oldest musical instrument in this world we always sing ginan in jamaat khana we don't read ginan we don't recite ginan we read farman but we don't read ginan we sing ginan and that's why where we say aaj to ginan sunkar maza aa gaya today the ginan was really really beautiful and what is there which made us to say oh the ginan was wonderful it was not only the voice but understanding of the text in which the reciter was reciting when you understand the words when you inhale those words in within you in olden people and even today in my you know my mother you know she hardly reads ginan book they used to memorize ginan by heart this was the connection from heart to heart yeah so what happens when you internalize the ginan with the text you understand the meaning you close your eyes and when you sing my god it it moves us it moves us to tears and that's where the magic of the speech and music happens thank you so much uh, dr gilani that was just amazingly wonderful um i think that should be the end of our q and a session we have gone way beyond <laughs> our set time but before we end may i request everyone to please give your feedback by clicking on the feedback form in the link in the chat box please the chat box please um and also if you can sign up on our facebook page you will receive the past recordings of our webinars as well as the future event notifications thank you as we come to the end of this webinar session i would like to say a big thank you to dr gilani for sharing this little studied area of music musicology and the ginans we are all enriched by the knowledge you have shared with us as well as your time so heartfelt thanks to you uh, Thank many you thanks to all of you many thanks to all of you the audience who have joined us from across the world uh, thank you for your time um, please be on a lookout for our future asg programs on facebook and also our webinar recordings on the a uh, association of the study of ginans asg uh, youtube channel um finally once again thank you all and have a wonderful evening thank you yali mudat molali mudat